Well, thanks, Greg, for inviting me to talk. So if you actually look, Greg, I think, does this. He gives me a random things and see if I can manage to cover all of it in 25 minutes. And so I'm, so I have no title for my talk because I, I wasn't sure what to call this. And so I'm, I'm kind of going to go rogue and just kind of see what happens. But part of what I'm going to talk about is based on um, <laughs> what, what the, uh, you know, as, as my patients come in and ask what's happening in myeloma therapy when we're, we're talking about treatments, the things that, that uh, I've been talking to them about. Um, but before I get to that, um, a couple things I do want to cover, and I think this goes along with, with some of the things you've, you've heard. You know, even if we figure out the genetic problem in someone's myeloma, we still have to figure out how best to treat it and at the same time not cause too many problems. And our, our goals for treating myeloma are to prolong survival but also to manage symptoms and not just the symptoms of the myeloma but the symptoms of the treatment. And, um, and one of the things that's on my list of topics is to save therapies for later or attack aggressively. So I'm going to get that over with now and I think Gareth already told you that answer which is attack it aggressively because what we want to do is get your disease under control as quickly as possible, get the best remission possible and whether that's MRD positive or negative those two guys are going to fight it out over later. Um, but is to control your disease so that whenever it might show itself again, the therapy we have for you is better than the therapy you had the first time. And we'll talk about some of those therapies that might be coming, coming along. So again, I would still say we can't call this disease fully curable. Curable meaning you get a therapy and you never have to be on therapy again. But we're probably getting closer to making it a chronic disease that you might need to be on maintenance therapy of some sort, but the disease is not causing an impact on, on your life. And as Jen said, uh, he said he went into imaging because um, it was easy. And I went into myeloma when there were only about four drugs um, we used to use. You had to learn a few drugs, something called VAD, which probably no one here has had VAD chemotherapy, and that's OK. Um, and then look at all the things that have happened. Let me see if this is working. But look at what's happened in just 10 years in multiple myeloma in terms of the number of drugs that have been approved as well as, I should have brought my cat's laser pointer because it works better, hold on. <laughs> okay, um, and I think this is the most important thing in terms of looking at how patients have done in the 1960s versus where we are now and how well people are doing. And it's not clear yet when we talk about averages, how long the average survival is for someone diagnosed today with multiple myeloma. Um, I think everyone in the room that uh, deals a lot of research would say that we're at eight to 10 plus uh, is the average. Um, I think the other thing that's important to talk about is, is just in terms of things that we need to know as, as the, the group that's helping take care of you and making sure you understand things. So there actually was a study that was done, I think, in Australia um, about 10 years ago where they looked at how much people remembered after they met with their doctor and heard that they had a cancer diagnosis. And it was actually under 50% of the information that was given to them. And so it's very important when you're hearing about treatments and talking about side effects to, to bring someone along. We talked about the caregivers in the room. Um, it's OK to record the the appointments. Uh, video I don't think is okay, I don't know. Someone once, I once walked into a room when I was still at Stanford, and this was before iPhones, and they actually had a video recorder and they had lights. <laughs> I'm serious, no, this, you think I'm making this up. This, this is Silicon Valley. They had someone with a microphone that was up in the air um, for their consultation, so I think that's getting a little much. Um, I think the other important thing is, uh, is that it's important to know your symptoms. And uh, you know, the symptoms that you have could be from the myeloma symptoms you have could be a sign of another problem going on. Symptoms can also be a, problem, a sign of complications of the therapy. And, and peripheral neuropathy has been talked about a few times. Um, but if you don't tell your doctor that your feet are numb or that you can't get out of bed at night and walk because it's too painful, they don't know that maybe you need a different therapy or maybe the dose needs to be adjusted. And this is actually a study, not in myeloma, but uh, it just looked at how important it is to hear about patient symptoms. So this was a study in people who had more solid tumors. 
and um, they were getting chemotherapy, and they were randomly assigned as to whether they got a way on the internet to report their symptoms to their, their treating team versus those who had the standard approach, which if they brought their symptoms up during the appointment or called in about it, they were considered standard. And if you actually look, the people that were on the symptom monitoring actually lived longer than the people who weren't. And again, it doesn't, it, it's not that saying everybody needs to be on the internet sending emails to your physicians, but I think it shows how important it is to know what's going on. I think the other important thing is, you know, this is a very complex disease. And again, 15 or 20 years ago, it wasn't a complex disease. It was a very difficult disease to treat. And there was very little we had to offer in terms of there was one or two types of chemotherapy and there was transplant and there was no thalidomide or Revlimid or Velcade or Kyprolis and all the other drugs I showed on that slide. And so it's really important to at least be, you know, consider seeing a specialist in myeloma. Um, it doesn't have to be the only doctor you see, but we, we work a lot with doctors in the community and work collaboratively to come up with the best options. One of the things you'll get from being seen at a, a myeloma specialty center, a transplant center, is not only someone who knows what the current therapies are, but I think access to clinical trials is very important. <clears throat> and this is actually something that was just uh, shown at one of our, our recent conferences. This looked at, uh, this was actually in North Carolina, so it's, all I'll say is it's North Carolina, but um, they looked at people who were referred to see a myeloma specialist at either a transplant center or a comprehensive cancer network. And then the other two lines are the people that were seen in the community and never referred to as a, a comprehensive cancer center. And the two lines are actually uh, the people that were seen at what were considered community providers that were low volume in myeloma. Low volume in myeloma here means they saw less than two, 10 myeloma patients over a two year period of time. And high volume means they saw more than 10. And I think the people, some of the people you've heard from today, um, I don't know what our numbers are, but it, we, we see a few hundred newly diagnosed myeloma patients per year per physician here, and this is what we do. And so I think in terms of some of the things I'm gonna to talk to you about, it's important to, to uh, be up to date with what the therapies are and what's coming. So this was the other thing I was supposed to, uh, to cover how to think about treatments and development. And, um, and so <clears throat> I missed the beginning of, of uh, Dr. Van Ness's talk, but it sounds like he was, he was sending you to school a little bit. <clears throat> and so that's what we're gonna do now. And we're gonna talk about immunotherapy, because I think of the things that are coming around the corner, the thing that's most important, the things that's mo most exciting is, is there a way to harness the immune system to attack multiple myeloma? And there will be a test later <laughs> um, and so I'm going to talk about a few things, and I'm not going to go into huge detail because there's a lot to cover. This isn't all the immunotherapies, but just some of the things you've heard about, and I know you've, you've heard a bit uh, about CAR T cells, and we're going to talk about that, but also some of the other ways we can use antibodies and the immune system to attack the disease. So, so get out your, everyone should be taking notes now. So what's the immune system there for? So one of the things the immune system there is to, to help protect us from infection, and you don't have to copy this slide down. But what we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about this part of thing, the white blood cells and the different types of white blood cells. And before you had a diagnosis of myeloma, to, to everyone probably in this room, a white blood cell was a white blood cell, and a plasma cell, who knew what a plasma cell was? But it's actually a very important part of the normal immune system, the plasma cells are part of the, the immune system that helps make antibodies to fight infection. And so in a normal plasma cell, you make antibodies, and if you get a vaccine for influenza, you'll turn on specific plasma cells in your normal plasma cells that make antibodies to fight influenza. If you get a tetanus shot, you have different plasma cells that make antibodies to tetanus. In multiple myeloma, what you've got is one of those plasma cells that's gone wrong. It's making antibodies in some degree in most patients. That's the M spike that you, you always hear about or the light change you hear about. 
But it turns out you can use antibodies in a different way, and that is, can we take the power of an antibody, which is, again, something your body can make to fight infection, can we use it to fight the, the myeloma? And so I can't draw at all. Like, I'm stick figure drawing, so I'm gonna, uh, the computer does these basic things for me, luckily. But let's talk about the standard chemotherapy drugs. And when I talk about standard chemotherapy, I, I also mean novel drugs, but things like Velcade, for example, is a, a injection you get or we give you a pill like Revlimid and that gets into your bloodstream, it floats around, it finds its way into the myeloma cell and hopefully the myeloma cell dies. But those drugs aren't pretty, aren't very specific and uh, for example if you've had Velcade, Velcade likes nerve cells too and there's nothing that keeps the Velcade from getting inside that nerve cell and irritating a little bit causing that tingling and numbness and pain. Now these drugs are very good and luckily they're, they're preferential. They cause more damage to the myeloma cells than they do to a nerve cell or other cells, for example, but a lot of the side effects come from the fact that they're not very specific. So one of the new drugs that you, you may have heard about, and I, I missed some of the early talks, I, I apologize, but uh, drugs like daratumumab or elutuzumab are, are antibodies that were designed in the lab to actually attack specific proteins that are on the surface of the myeloma cell. And so what's different about that is that instead of getting an injection of Velcade in your stomach and that Velcade just finding any cell it happens to find, the antibody therapies like daratumumab float around and they only stick if you happen to have the right thing for them to stick to. And so a drug like daratumumab looks for a protein called CD38 and essentially the only cells in your body that have CD38 are myeloma cells and they leave the, the nerve cells alone. Now, it's not that there's no side effects, but this is sort of the first level of specificity that we have that we didn't have for, for myeloma until recently. Anybody ready for a quiz? No quizzes yet? Okay, so what, what else can we get from the immune system? So one of the things you want is you don't want the immune system to attack your own body. And there are cells that can do that, and if you've heard of, of diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and multiple sclerosis, that's the immune system attacking the own, your own body. And the other thing is, is there a way that your, your immune system can protect you from cancer? And it turns out one of the theories, at least, of, of how cancers develop is that our immune system is actually supposed to be protecting us from cancer. And if you get a cancer, it means the immune system messed up. Um, this morning, Dr. Van Ness was talking about the genetics of, of myeloma, that myeloma cells have genetic changes. They get these random mutations, and then they become a cancer cell. And what's supposed to happen is if, you, if your cells start to make these mistakes, then either they're supposed to not keep growing, or hopefully the immune system finds them and destroys them. And it, when that doesn't happen, that can lead to a, a cancer. And so there actually is another part of the immune system. I really cannot master the, the, the laser pointer. This is pretty sad. Um, there's another part of the immune system which are called the T cells, the killer T cells, that are actually another important part of your ability to fight infection, but also is something that we might be able to harness. And so um, when we actually look at how the immune system works, not only does the immune system have cells like plasma cells that make antibodies to fight infection, but we have these cells that we call T cells or killer T cells, Mr. T cell, I don't know. Um, and what these do is they, they're also very specific. You, you know, not any T cell will do any job. The T cells actually have a receptor on their surface and that only fits into one specific protein or fights one specific infection. And so the killer T cells have the ability to find a cell that might have a viral infection inside of it or, or maybe it's a cancer cell that has proteins on the surface that don't belong there. And if you happen to have a T cell with the right receptor, it hopefully can actually destroy the abnormal cell. And it's one of the ways our body eradicates viruses, is not only making antibodies, but also to, to use T cells to kill cells that are infected. <coughs> but cancer cells, uh, they do tricky things. Not only do they figure out how to get around our chemo drugs, which you heard about earlier, but a T cell, when it's floating around, is also not supposed to attack good parts of our body. And, and so a T cell actually has a, a receptor on it, and this is getting pretty complicated, and this, this will be on the test, um, called PD-1. And if, P, if a T cell finds a cell and wants to attack it, 
if its PD-1 gets blocked up by a cancer cell, for example, it just stays quiet. It basically hides from the immune system. And so even though this T cell maybe wants to kill this tumor cell, it's getting a signal that says, hey, leave me alone. Just ignore me. But it turns out there's drugs that can block that. And so there are actually a group of drugs that were designed actually not for multiple myeloma, but for other tumors. And it actually blocks this so that now if a T cell happens to find one of these tumor cells, it doesn't get to do that handshake and say, hey, leave me alone, because you can block the receptor in one side or another. This is on video, me trying to actually use the laser pointer, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so these are called, this is called checkpoint blockade. And, I, and Dr. Van Ness mentioned that, you know, as we learn about the genetics of things, and this is a little different than that, but he mentioned a gene called RAS. Well, there's drugs that are out there for RAS that were not designed for myeloma, but they might have an impact on a myeloma cell that has RAS. And it turns out these drugs that were not designed for multiple myeloma, and there's all sorts of names, and I can't pronounce most of these, but these are approved for things like colon cancer or lung cancer, Hodgkin's disease. Um, these drugs actually can have an impact because they block the ability of the tumor cell to hide. And so, um, for example, one of the studies, and, and this is important because um, a lot of studies have opened based on this, but this was a study looking at this drug called pembrolizumab, or it's called Keytruda. It's used for melanoma. Um, it was combined with a drug called pomalidomide, and you guys may have heard of that. Pomalidomide is a cousin of, of lenalidomide or revlimid um, and dexamethasone. And, and I think the key thing here is that this looked at a group of people who had had multiple lines of therapy, and what they found is that more than half of the people responded to a combination of the pomalidomide and this checkpoint blockade. And this here, this uh, actually shows the M spike that we talked about, the, the spike from the myeloma. And what you can see is in the vast majority of patients, that spike went down. Um, and this shows the responses. Now, unfortunately, there may be some problems with this. And, and a lot of these studies right now are on hold because some future studies that were based on that have shown that these drugs may not be, may not be the best, at least in the combinations we're using now. And so, uh, there are two additional studies that were going on that looked at using this drug, pembrolizumab, in addition to revlimid and lenalidomide, uh, revlimid and, and pomalidomide, and found that the people getting this drug didn't do as well. And so right now we're trying to understand that, but it's still, I think, an important part of understanding the immune system and our ability to potentially take advantage of that checkpoint inhibition and getting the cells to come out of hiding. All right. Um, so as I said, one of the things that you can do to get the T cells involved is to make it so the cell can't hide. But then the other problem is you have to have a T cell that knows to recognize your myeloma cell. And again, one of the, the potential issues with why we might have cancers in the first place is that our immune system doesn't have its own T cells that recognize the myeloma cell. But if you happen to get one of those, uh, what you would get is a T cell, again, a killer T cell, that attaches to your myeloma cell. Now, once it gets there, it has to get revved up and turned on. And, and there's a whole bunch of signals, and, and that'll be in Immunology 201 the next time we talk about what are called co-stimulatory molecules. But once a T cell engages, it needs to be told, hey, rev up, wake up, and, and kill this cell. And so what happens is that once the T cell gets revved up, it expands, it turns on its killing signal, and actually kills the myeloma cell. And so there's a, a technology that has been mentioned before called a chimeric antigen receptor T cell or CAR T cell, where the T cells are genetically modified to learn to attack multiple myeloma. And at the same time, they're given signals so that once they find the myeloma cell that they get revved up and turned on. And so that is a CAR T cell. And, and it's, uh, it's actually fairly complicated. I'm going to walk you through it because I think it's important to understand it because if you read the newspaper, New York Times says CAR T cells are curing all these cancers and they're very simple and they have no side effects. And it's a very complex process to do this and, um, and there are side effects that go along with it. I think the other thing, and I'll, I'll talk more about the studies very briefly, is that this is still investigational therapy in multiple myeloma. Um, but here's what happens. 
And if I manage, here we go, I manage this. So in, so in order to get CAR T cells, the first thing that has to happen is you have to get your T cells out of your body. And so that's done by apheresis, and, and many of you here I know have had transplants. You've had an apheresis procedure. You've had your stem cells collected. In this case, what are collected are T cells. It's the same sort of machine. We just pull out a different group of cells. And then those are sent off either to the lab or if there's a commercial product sent off to a drug company. And what's done is the T cells, your own T cells, are now genetically modified. So they're put through a very special process where they actually are typically infected with a, a special virus that's going to actually bring into the T cell the T cell receptor that's going to now sit on the surface and be able to find the myeloma. Pretty crazy stuff. It has to know what to look for. So each, when a, a T cell is modified, the receptor that's put on it has to be a receptor that's specific to the cancer. So there are actually two drugs approved that are genetically modified T cells, one for lymphoma and one for leukemia. And if you give those to people with myeloma, they don't really work because myeloma cells don't have on their surface the same thing that leukemia and lymphoma does. So these have to be done right now. Each patient has to have their own T cells collected and modified in the lab. They get, in, they get a virus stuck inside of them that puts a receptor on their surface. And then they're shipped back from the lab. And we have to get them back into the patient. And so that you get a little bit of chemo. I say a little bit of chemo. It's a chemo. But it's chemo that actually is not meant to kill the myeloma cells. It's just meant to suppress your immune system to allow these cells to get inside the body and grow. And what they do is they find their way to cells that have the, the protein they're looking for, and that's the myeloma cells. They attack them. They get revved up. They turn on. They kill the tumor cells. It sounds pretty good. It actually works. And so just to show the complexity of this, this is a, one of the CAR T cells that's used in multiple myeloma. It looks for a protein called BCMA, which most myeloma cells have, but not all do. Um, and it, is genetically, mod genetically inserted into the T cells, and then there's these things called co-stimulatory parts that tell the T cell, hey, once you find the myeloma cell, kill it. And there have been a number of studies that have, that have uh, been done. A number of groups have reported it. This is just one, and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides, um, where people who have multiple myeloma that's come back many times, so what we would call relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, had their T cells removed, had them genetically modified, with the virus, and then they were reinfused into the patients. Um, and the people who got this, if you actually look here, on average had had seven prior lines of therapy. That means they've failed seven prior types of chemo. They've had a transplant and they've relapsed. They've had kyprolis and relapsed over and over again. So people were, they often didn't have a lot of other options of treatments to be used. And as you can see here, these are all the, the percentage of people that were exposed to all of these different drugs. Um, and all of the patients had already had a transplant. Um, there are side effects to this, and I'll mention them briefly, something called cytokine release syndrome. The immune system gets so revved up and so excited at killing the myeloma cells that chemicals can be released that can make people fairly sick. There can be toxicity to the brain that can be uh, pretty severe, um, and of course it can affect the blood counts. But what this shows, and, and don't try to memorize this slide, um, except to show, this looks at people who got CAR T cells, the ones at the top got more T cells infused or a higher dose. Um, but what you can see is that many of these people went into good remissions. Green is a complete remission. Blue is a very good partial remission. Many of these patients became what we would call MRD negative, so that, that very high level of looking for the, the myeloma was negative. They were in a very good remission. Um, but what's very important is that many people still progress. Now, the response rate was very high. Over 90% of the people in this study had a response, meaning their myeloma shrunk in response to just an infusion of these immune system cells. So it's very exciting, but this particular study doesn't even go out to two years. And what we don't know with this therapy, especially in multiple myeloma, is how best to use this therapy, how long will this therapy work, we don't know how long the cells, once they're infused, will stay in the body, and we don't know how long they need to stay in the body to be effective. Um, and so as I mentioned, there are a couple of, of significant side effects. Cytokine release syndrome uh, just overwhelms the immune system. People can get very low blood pressure and fevers and require time in the intensive care unit. Some people can have swelling of the brain and seizures. 
So the New York Times may say this is a, a great therapy and it's easy, but it, it can be dangerous. And one of the things we're trying to understand is, is there a way to get the effect from the, the immune system that we need, but without getting all of the side effects? As I mentioned, there's two approved therapies. Uh, it takes a while to do this. It typically takes about three weeks to get the T cells genetically modified. So it means once the cells are collected, you still have to deal with the myeloma if it's active, and that can be a problem in some people. And uh, cost is, I ran out of dollar signs. Um, but the estimated cost for this, at least in patients with lymphoma and leukemia, the drug itself costs almost a half a million dollars for the actual in dr drug, the actual T cells to be made, and, uh, and probably close to another half a million dollars for the care of the person getting the cell. So a million dollar therapy. And again, this may be a great therapy, but it's, it's really not clear. Is this a therapy that's a million dollars and works for six months? Does it cure people? We don't know. So I think it's very important to, to know about this therapy. I think it may be a part of our treatments in the future, but um, we just don't know yet. It's certainly not an approved therapy. So there's, there's more. I'm going to do a little more, and then we're going to take a break. Um, so are, there are other things that are around the corner, and, and in fact, one of these, uh, one of these types of drugs, uh, we have a study that actually just opened here, is, well, is there something you can do without having to take someone's cells out and genetically modify them? Is there some way you can get the T cells that we want to kill the cells, uh, to the myeloma cells, without having to take them out and genetically modify them? And so there's something now called a bite cell, a bite therapy, a bispecific T cell engager, um, and basically what this is, is we talked about daratumumab, an antibody therapy that finds a protein on the surface of the myeloma cell. And, and so what bite therapy is, and there's one of these approved for a type of leukemia, it takes an antibody that finds something on the surface of the myeloma cell, attaches it to another piece of an antibody that actually sticks to T cells, something called CD3, and basically brings the two together. And so. Um, bite cells get the T cell engaged and then turns on the killing signal and kills the myeloma. And this is very early. The therapies, uh, the, the trials with, with bites uh, for myeloma are just starting. As I mentioned, we, we just, uh, as part of a, a trial with other centers, uh, that's open now. I won't go through this one. Again, one of the things about these therapies I'm talking about, the antibodies, the CAR T cells, and the, the bite therapies is they have to be specific to the, the cancer you're treating and the, the proteins that they're targeting have to be the right proteins and we're still trying to understand what these different proteins are, but these are the types of proteins that are being looked at. And the last thing before your quiz is what else can you do? Well, if we can, we can make antibodies find the cancer cell, we can maybe get them to bring T cells along with them, can we just use them as a way to deliver a chemotherapy, some sort of poison to the cell? And so. The other thing that's being used in myeloma, again, in investigational, and I think this will, you'll hear some more about other ways to do these sorts of things um, from our CMMN group, um, is an antibody drug conjugate. How about you just take that antibody like daratumumab and throw some poison on it and use it as a delivery system. And so antibody drug conjugates are being tested, and again, there are trials that are open now that look at this where you have an antibody, what's attached to it is a bit of a poison, basically a chemotherapy drug or a cellular poison that's stuck to the antibody. And as long as it's floating around in the blood and stuck, it doesn't do anything, but once it finds the cell that it can stick to, it gets inside the cell and kills it. Uh, otherwise, the cells that don't have the target don't get a, a exposed to the, the poison. And so these are, are also being tested in the clinic as well. And so uh, there's, there's one particular one, GSK, a whole bunch of numbers. Um, 2857916, this is an antibody drug conjugate that's been tested, it's in trials now, and in the group of patients that were treated, 60% of the patients who got this antibody drug conjugate, so just an antibody that brought poison into the cell, 60% of the patients responded. So that's it for this uh, before the quiz. So what's the future of myeloma therapy? I think immunotherapy of some sort is probably part of it, but I don't think it's that simple, and I think that's the theme you've heard throughout the day. I don't think a single approach will necessarily fix the problem of myeloma. It's probably going to be sequential therapies or combination therapies. 
Um, I think it's very important uh, that the therapy that you get is customized to your specific needs in terms of what side effects are acceptable, what do we know about the genetics of your cancer and does that have an impact of things. And I always put clinical trials, everything I've talked about, all the drugs that you've had are because of clinical trials. And so it's very important when you're talking with your doctor to hear about clinical trials and, and consider participating. And with that, I'm going to end.